On October 14, 2014, over 160 travelers set out on one of the most beautiful routes of Mount Annapurna. Despite it being an 8,000er, they didn't need any tents or guides on their way to Thorong La Pass, as there were plenty of shelters and marked trails. 21-year-old Maya initially thought it was a light and fun stroll with friends, but within hours, it turned into a death march. So, what did the Himalayas really have in store for their guests? As always, viewer discretion is advised. In the world, there are 14 8,000ers. Simply speaking, mountain peaks rising over 8,000 meters above sea level. Annapurna ranks 10th among them. Scaling such heights demands significant preparation and skills. However, Maya, an Israeli, lacked such experience, so she and her friends chose the Annapurna Circuit trekking route. Of course, it's no walk in the park. The full journey takes about 18 days, and its highest point, Thorong La Pass, is located at 5,416 meters. Yet Annapurna Circuit is considered one of the most beautiful and intriguing trekking routes globally. You can witness mountain peaks, local villages, temples, sacred sites, and breathtaking nature. What's even more important is that the route is dotted with settlements and lodges, so tourists don't need to carry a ton of gear. The best time for Annapurna Circuit is considered autumn. However, meteorologists predicted sudden weather deterioration in early October of 2014. Nevertheless, hundreds of tourists continued their journey no matter what. On October 12th at 5.30 a.m., Maya and her friends left the shelter at High Camp to head for Thorong La Pass. The first thing they saw was nearly 30 centimeters of fresh snow. The weather worsened and a blizzard began. Guides reassured them, but as the sun rose, the wind rushing at their backs turned into a nightmare. A powerful storm engulfed the mountain. The wind became so fierce that it instantly erased footprints and visibility dropped to less than 100 meters. Dozens of tourists turned back immediately, but it led them into a deadly trap. They had to walk against the storm without landmarks. The rest of the group, including Maya, decided to continue the ascent to the pass, hoping to find shelter. Little did they know, a worse situation awaited them on the pass. Due to the landscape, the wind was much stronger there, and the temperature plummeted to minus 50 degrees Celsius. Maya and others had to battle nature for five hours until they finally reached shelter. However, instead of relief, the tourists felt the onset of panic. The building was packed with terrified and freezing people. Maya handed her sleeping bag to her husband, who was suffering from acute hypothermia and curled up, hoping to get a bit warmer. Still, the raging storm outside wasn't the only problem for the travelers. Many of them had naively thought that Annapurna Circuit was an easy route, so they ignored basic safety rules, especially for the need of acclimatization. Due to the steep ascent to over 5,000 meters, many fell victim to altitude sickness caused by a lack of oxygen, leading to reduced performance, dizziness, general weakness, and impaired cognitive abilities. So, a lot of tourists couldn't make informed decisions. When the crowd started talking about inevitable doom, people decided they needed to go to the next lower point on the route. Maya and her friends were clueless about what to do. Then, local guys offered to guide them to a safe place for a small fee. The tourists agreed, but they were ditched and left without any money. Some of Maya's friends, along with other tourists, dared to leave the shelter and face the storm to reach the lower camp. However, Maya decided to stay in the building on the pass. She suffered intensely from the cold and by the next morning, she couldn't take it anymore. With her six remaining companions, the girl finally mustered the courage to descend from the mountain. Unfortunately, a real horror awaited them once they stepped out of their temporary shelter. The snow cover on the pass had reached about one and a half meters. As the tourists began to make their way through the drifts, they stumbled upon corpses. About 20 frozen to death people surrounded Maya, among them, she noticed her friends who had gone looking for shelter the night before. The girl was terrified to think that the same fate might await her as well. Nonetheless, she found the strength to move forward, navigating through the snowdrifts and dense fog. Meanwhile, a powerful storm left the region without electricity, telephone, and mobile communications. So, the trapped tourists of Annapurna couldn't call for help. Even if they could, rescuers couldn't reach them due to the bad weather. 
Only by midday did the situation improve, and one of the largest rescue missions in the history of the Himalayas began. As it turned out, the storm triggered avalanches across the region. In the village of Fu, they found the bodies of eight people, and in the base tourist camp, the weather killed five more, burying them alive in their tents. Maya and her six companions were very lucky. Firstly, they survived, and secondly, they were evacuated before the weather worsened again, halting the search efforts. However, by then, the bodies of 10 deceased climbers had already been brought down from Thurong Law. It took several days to comprehend the scale of the catastrophe, which was unprecedented. 518 people, both locals and tourists, were rescued from the storm's aftermath. Yet, in the vicinity of Annapurna during those tragic days, 43 people lost their lives. Among them were tourists from at least six countries, including Maya's friends from Israel. Moreover, the storm likely buried alive another 50 people considered missing. Yet in the mountains, challenges aren't just about death. Often, those who survive such disasters only continue their existence physically while being dead on the inside. A similar thing happened to Maya, who kept shuddering every time she remembered her frozen friends in the snow. Climbers on Mount Manislu, in the peak season of 2012, went through the same experience. This Himalayan peak is the eighth highest in the world and is considered relatively easy compared to other 8,000ers. Yet despite this reputation, it claimed the lives of over 80 people. The route to the summit of Manislu traverses a glacier with giant crevices, an active ice fall between the first and second camps, and a serac field between the third and fourth. Seracs are massive, unstable ice formations that can fall at any moment, triggering an avalanche. They occur on Manislu catastrophically often because the region gets a lot of snow each year, whereas the weather is much warmer than on other 8,000ers. In late summer and early fall of 2012, the mountain experienced an unusually heavy snowfall. So when the weather finally cleared up by mid-September, the climbers made a dash for the summit. However, just a week later, a powerful snowstorm hit Manislu. Climbers had managed to ascend to the second and third camps, bunkering down in their tents to wait out the bad weather. It was around 4.30 a.m. when a massive serac broke off above the third camp. A few minutes later, professional skiers Glenn Plake and Gregory Costa, stationed at the third camp, heard a rumble. Initially, Costa thought it was a strong wind gust, but then he realized it was an avalanche. In the next moment, Plake saw his companion tossed out of the tent by a powerful air wave preceding the wall of snow. Plake, along with his tent, was catapulted into the air and dragged 300 meters down the mountain. When the chaos subsided, he found himself in his sleeping bag, tangled in a wrecked tent, with a headlamp still on his forehead. Plake quickly got out of his gear and looked around. The avalanche buried all 25 tents in the third camp, along with the people there. Plake observed the area for 10 minutes before realizing he had been barefoot the entire time. Miraculously, he managed to locate all his belongings. The only things missing were his partners, Greg and Remy, who had spent the night in a different tent. Meanwhile, the airwave from the avalanche reached the second camp. At that moment, climber Phil Crampton had just settled comfortably for sleep when he was suddenly lifted into the air with his tent and companion. Tossed several times, they remained relatively unharmed. It turned out that everyone in the 12 tents of the second camp experienced the same. They found themselves exposed to the sky in complete darkness, battered, but alive. Remarkably, they all remained calm and collected. Climbers and their local guides, the Sherpas, quickly began gathering equipment they could retrieve from under the snow, and they were only missing one boot. Suddenly, a barefoot, injured man arrived at the ruined camp. It turned out to be a Sherpa swept away by the avalanche from the third camp. Then, the climbers realized that a catastrophe had occurred. They were the first to go to help the people in the third camp, and later, rescuers joined them as well. The Serac, which caused the avalanche, was indeed gigantic, about 600 meters across. Since nearly 1 meter 80 centimeters of fresh snow had fallen in the mountains the day before, it resulted in an immensely powerful avalanche. 500 meters wide and 1,000 meters long. Under all that pile of snow, 31 climbers were trapped. By the end of the day, rescuers managed to help 20 of them, yet not everyone survived. 
Search teams found eight bodies, with several people still considered missing. Both partners of Glenn Plake, Gregory Costa and Remy Lecluse, were among them. Days passed, but nobody could locate them. Even Lecluse's widow arrived on the glacier, hoping to at least say goodbye to her deceased husband. And only after two weeks of continuous search, Remy's body was finally found. Overall, the tragedy claimed the lives of 11 people, with two of them lost forever in the snows of Manislu. And this is yet another terrible option the mountains can offer, the eternal disguise. Obviously, climbers aren't easily scared by this, like in any other sport. People here not only strive to achieve a result, but also compete with each other. So the French expedition made history as the world's first conquerors of Annapurna. In 1950, they conquered the 8,000er summit, but 20 years later, British climbers also claimed the top spot, taking on the challenge from the southern face, not the northern one like the French. Today, it's known as the British route, yet 11 years later, a Japanese expedition tackled an even steeper ridge on the southern slope, marking the birth of a new route. That just further fueled the ambitious climbers to seek even tougher paths to the summit. That's why in 1992, French alpinists Pierre Béjean and Jean-Christophe Lefay decided to forge their own route. It ran between the British and Japanese ones and was incredibly steep and dangerous. The climbers reached 7,400 meters when a sudden storm forced them to retreat. Yet Pierre Béjean slipped and perished on the way back, so they named the uncharted path after him. After this tragedy, only the legendary climber Ulle Steck, known as the Swiss Machine, attempted Béjean's route. However, he got caught in a rockfall and had to abandon the attempt. Since then, ascending the Began route has become one of the most coveted dreams for the world's best climbers. This challenge was taken up by South Korean athlete Park Young Sok. He conquered all 14 8,000ers and visited both the North and South Poles. So, in 2010, Park Young Sok, together with two partners, attempted the first ascent of the Began route. However, one climber from their team injured his knee and all three had to halt the ascent. Nevertheless, they returned the next year. This time, Park Young Sok was determined to reach the summit, no matter what. The trio started their journey on October 17th and reached 6,400 meters within a day. The South Koreans pushed forward without setting up camps, carrying only the essentials. Being some of the best experts in the world, they knew what they were doing. However, nature interfered with their plans. A sudden storm hit Annapurna and despite Park Young Sok's ambitions, he radioed to the base camp that he and his team were returning. He never contacted them again. Two days later, after the storm subsided and there was no word from the climbers, a helicopter was sent for their search. Yet, there were no signs of the three men. Soon, a ground team of nearly 20 people joined the search, but they could only find a piece of rope that might not even be from the Korean team. The operation lasted nine days, the missing climbers were searched from the air on the mountain slopes amidst rock falls and in glacier crevices. Still, there was no trace of Park Young Sok and his colleagues. Devastated, the friends of the Korean climber vowed not to return to Annapurna until they found his body. Although they haven't succeeded so far, they remain hopeful. Park Young Sok's son even battles his acrophobia and fear of heights to join the search. And while the young man hopes to ascend the summit and find his father's remains one day, he knows that for Park Young Sok, staying on the Annapurna forever is the best ending. The man used to say that climbers should be in the mountains until death comes. Indeed, most of those aiming to conquer the 8,000ers somehow accept these game rules. There's something that compels them to return to the steep slopes time after time. Maybe it's the thrill and the desire for victory or perhaps the deadly call of the mountains, luring them for new sacrifices. Even legendary climbers succumb to it. Swiss Erhard Loriton and Frenchman Benoit Chamou. In 1995, each of them had a shot at making history as the third climber in the world to conquer all 8,000ers. Yeah, at that time, only two people had pulled it off. Loriton and Chamou had just one unconquered mountain left on their wish list, Kane Chenjunga. It's the third highest peak globally, kind of tucked away from the Himalayan 8,000ers. The remoteness, crazy slopes, and insanely tricky climbing gave it a deadly reputation. Only the slickest and boldest climbers dare take it on. That's why Loriton and Chamon 
were hellbent on outdoing each other on the way to the Kangchengjunga summit. Both crews set out from the base camp on October 3rd and hit a stop at 7,800 meters within a day. Around 2 a.m. on October 5th, the Swiss crew led by Loriton took off for the summit. Chameau, his partner, Pierre Ruyer, and their Sherpa followed suit shortly after. They were all worn out from yesterday's climb, but the worst was yet to come. After a few hours, Sherpa Riku paused for a minute to rest when he suddenly slipped. He tried to save himself but couldn't do anything, eventually tumbling off the mountain. Despite this tragedy, the French decided to keep climbing. Meanwhile, the Swiss team was moving way faster, and by lunchtime, they had already reached the top. Erhard Lorington became the third climber in the world to conquer all 8,000ers, and, satisfied with his win, he began the descent. Around 4 p.m., the Swiss met Chameau and Royer less than 200 meters from the summit. They looked tired and were without a Sherpa, but the French assured them everything was cool and they planned to continue climbing. However, within an hour, Benoit Chameau radioed the base camp, saying that Royer had decided to turn back and he was still moving toward the summit. However, his plans quickly changed. Chameau noticed the wind was getting stronger and the sun was about to set. So, at 6.15 p.m., he called the base camp again, sounding defeated, saying he was giving up the attempt on Kang Chengjunga and descending. After that call, no news came from either Chameau or Royer as a storm hit the mountain summit. The two French climbers were left stranded in the death zone, just in the midst of a snowstorm. It's unknown where Royer was, but he was likely above 8,000 meters. There, the air is so thin that cells in the human body literally die one by one due to lack of oxygen. Other climbers knew that every minute spent in this death zone dramatically reduces the chances of survival. So, when there was no word from the Frenchman by morning, nobody expected a miracle. Suddenly, the radio at the base camp came to life again. Benoit Chameau was on the line. The first thing he asked about was his partner, Pierre. But instead of talking to his climbing buddy, he heard Pierre hadn't returned. This news devastated the climber. Still, he intended to fight for his own life. The guy explained where he was, and the Swiss team managed to spot him through a telescope. Then, Erhard Loriton gave Chameau directions on where to head to reach the fourth camp. The Frenchman was constantly watched through the telescope, receiving new guidance each time. Chameau was moving at a snail's pace, taking a break every 10 steps. That continued until the Frenchman turned around a mountain ridge, vanishing from the telescope's view. Since then, no one has ever seen him again. By evening, the weather went south again, and any chances of survival for the two French climbers were gone for good. It took a week to organize a search for their bodies. Despite having a rough idea of where Chameau disappeared, finding him proved impossible. The only thing remotely hinting at his presence on the mountain was a radio found on one of the ledges. Despite the tragedy, the climbing community criticized the decisions made by Royer and Chameau during the ascent. They continued climbing despite the Sherpa's death which was reckless and disrespectful. Moreover, many believe Chameau was completely blinded by the desire to reach the summit and couldn't make sound decisions. However, the best climbers in the world acknowledge that this deadly call of the mountains can be literally insurmountable. It compels them to return again and again, risking their lives to reach new heights. And for this, there's no better place than the Himalayas. It's home to 10 of the 14 8,000ers, including the world's highest peak, Everest, where over 320 climbers have lost their lives. Moreover, the season of 2023 became Everest's deadliest in history, claiming 18 lives. Despite this, the Himalayas continue to welcome tourists. Of course, not always amicably, but who cares? And what about you? Do you feel the fatal call of the mountains too? Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe to the channel if you're eager for more videos on the world's most dangerous places.